you'd like to turn to the book of Hebrews and chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, it's page 1980. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, then reading from verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, the Messiah. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, baptisms, laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal <coughs> judgment. And this we shall do, if God permits. <clears throat> I want us to think a little bit about repentance again this morning. And I want us to think about three things. The first is the necessity of repentance. The necessity of repentance. Secondly, the meaning of repentance. What do we mean by repent? <clears throat> and thirdly, the time. The time for repentance. The time for repentance. But first I want to talk a little bit about foundations. It says here, laying a foundation. <coughs> there are foundational doctrines. There are foundational teachings. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 says, There is no other foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation on which we must all build. And it is that. It is a building. We need to be built up. We need to build. And Jesus is the foundation. It is a person. We need to come to him. We need <clears throat> to trust him. And we need to follow him. Jesus is the one that we need to come to. He is the rock. He is the foundation and it is centered on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in Hebrews we are told of six, six foundational doctrines. And the first one is repentance from dead works. There's quite a lot in the scriptures about having right foundations. You might think of the parable that Jesus told about the wise man and a foolish man. And the wise man built his house upon the rock. And the foolish man, he built his house on the sand. Now I'm sure the houses must have looked fairly similar. In fact, the foolish man's house may well have looked even better than the wise man's house. Because he'd saved a lot on the foundations. So he might have put himself on a nice conservatory. The two houses outwardly looked okay. But when the storm came, it revealed, dear friends, the quality of the foundations. And the foolish man's house was in ruin. There are many people, dear friends, that outwardly look okay. They say the right things. They talk about Jesus Christ being their Lord and Savior. Jesus said many they will be on Judgment Day. That many will come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? 
Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do many miracles? And Jesus said, I will have to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. They'd come in through the broad road. And that broad road leads to destruction. They'd never truly come to repentance. They'd never truly come to repentance. In the scripture that we read, <clears throat> it says we must lay that foundation. And that foundation may be built upon if God permits. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? If God permits. Now, we don't often follow godly principles in this world, do we? But we do actually have some semblance of um, <clears throat> similarity here in that if you apply for planning permission on a house, you will come across things called building regulations. The planning department will want to know what you're building and they'll want to know all about it. They'll want to know the materials you're going to use and you must follow the general plan that you put in. And the planning authority will send out a planning officer and one of the most important things that he will inspect at a certain point, you've got to let him know the foundations. The foundations. And the planning officer will come out and he'll look at the foundations and he'll either say, well, that's okay, you can build on that. Or he'll say, no chance. You're not building on that. You'll have to dig it all up again and put proper foundations in. And dear friends, God looks for the foundations. And if we've not come and put in the foundations, guess what? You cannot build spiritually on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not come to a true repentance, God will not permit you to build. On this we build, if God permits. Well, dear friends, if you've not got the right foundations in, guess what? You're not going to grow. You're not going to grow spiritually. That's true for individuals and it's true for churches. Why is the church in such a mess today? Why is there such an immaturity? Why at the first sign of a storm does everything fall apart? Because we've not got the foundations in. And God won't even permit anything of any substance to be built. We just don't get God's go-ahead. Because he's looking at the foundations and he's saying, well, we can't put anything on that. Until somebody comes and digs it up and puts in right foundations. There's a necessity, dear friends, for repentance. And sadly, the church has been preaching a gospel without repentance for, I don't know, two generations at least. We're preaching a gospel, come to Jesus and accept him. Come to Jesus, open the door of your heart. Come to Jesus and believe in him. Just trust Jesus. Just come forward and accept him. It's not biblical, dear friends, any of it. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. repent. Let's look at one or two scriptures. Acts 17 and verse 30. Let's just make sure I've quoted it right. Paul was preaching, preaching 
in Athens. Page 1798. <clears throat> Surrounded by idols and his spirit stirred with a jealousy for these people. God is jealous, dear friends, and angry with idolatry. And Paul preaches, and verse 30 he says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all, everywhere, should repent. Who needs to repent, dear friends? All, everywhere. All, everywhere, must repent. God has commanded all, everywhere, to repent. The first principle of foundational doctrine is repentance from dead works. And if we do not preach repentance, if men will not repent, they will not be genuinely saved, they will not come to true faith in Jesus Christ and they will never ever be in a position to be built on spiritually and come to maturity. They will forever be double-minded and unstable in all their ways. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 11 and verse 18. The hearing of Gentiles being saved. You know the most remarkable thing in the early church? That God would save dogs. That's us. Now, you listen to preaching in the church, you'd think the most amazing thing would be that God saved Jews. But the gospel was given to them. The covenant was given to them. We're brought in as strangers and aliens through Jesus Christ. Well, they were amazed. God was saving Gentiles. This is what it says, Acts 11 and verse 18, when they heard this, they quieted down, glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also, what? Repentance that leads to life. What leads to life, dear friends? Repentance. Can you come to new life in Christ without repentance? <coughs> No, there's one thing that leads you there. Repentance. Before the Messiah came, before the Word was made flesh, before that great light shone in darkness, a messenger was sent, a voice crying in the wilderness. And what was his message? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance prepares the way, dear friends, for Jesus Christ to meet with a person and grant them newness of life, that they be born again. And except a man be born again, he'll not see, he'll not enter the kingdom of God. But repentance leads to life. And without it, dear friends, no man will be saved. No one. Repentance leads to life. Mark chapter 1. Jesus came preaching. <clears throat> we hear all kinds of crazy doctrine and preaching in the church today. Things like, just accept Jesus, God will lead you into repentance, he'll sort everything else out later. 
It's not biblical, dear friends. And all it's producing is false converts. Repentance leads to life. Repentance leads to life. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus came into Galilee. He was preaching the gospel of God, the good news of God. Jesus was preaching. The word himself was preaching. What was his message? He was saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Well, Lord, don't you mean just believe and, and maybe repent later? No. Repent and believe the gospel. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of, for forgiveness of sins. Jesus said that we are to go into all the world, preach the gospel, we're to go make disciples of all nations, and he said that repentance for forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed. Must be. Repentance. We don't want to do it. Just ask Jesus into your heart. Just believe in him. Just accept him. No. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. And repentance leads to life, dear friends. We must repent and believe the gospel. Repent. True and genuine saving faith and regeneration does not come without repentance. It doesn't. And never will. There must be repentance. It leads to life. It prepares the way for saving faith. It's that order. It's that order in Hebrews chapter 6. It's that order everywhere in the New Testament. Repentance before faith. Before believing. So what do we mean by repent? <clears throat> Well, the New Testament word is metaneo. And it means to turn and change our way of thinking. We need to change our way of thinking completely. Turn around in the way that we think. The Old Testament word simply means to turn around. It's a 180 degree turn. We're going in completely the wrong direction. We're going our own way. We're walking away from God. We're doing our own thing. And the Old Testament says, return. Turn around. We need to do a 180 degree turn in the whole direction of our lives. Because we're going the wrong way completely. And so repentance means a turnaround and a complete change in thinking in the way that we think. What repentance isn't is an emotional experience. You may be convicted of sin. That may induce an emotion. But repentance is not an emotional experience. It is an act of the will. It is an act of the will. It is a choice that we make. Do you choose to turn around? You don't get a great big hand coming down from heaven and twiddling you around 180 degrees, do you? No, you choose to turn. 
your direction. You choose to turn around in the way that you go. It is an act of will. Metaneo was also used as <clears throat> a, a term in battle. On the rare occasions that the Romans were, were being um, given a good hiding, the commander would sound the command Metaneo, which basically means a bad turn. We can't keep on like this. We're getting a good hiding. The enemy is going to destroy us. We need to turn around and run for our lives. Metaneo. Dear friends, we're enemies of God by nature. We can't keep on kicking against the gods. We're fighting against God going our own way. And there's only ever going to be one loser when you're fighting against God. And it's not God. And so what do we need to do? Metaneo. You hear the sound. You hear the cry. Metaneo. Repent. Turn around. You're on a loser. You're in a battle. You're in a war against God. And you need to turn around completely and flee from the wrath to come. And run to the Savior. And put your trust in him. Metaneo. Repent. Change in the way you think. Change and turn. Jesus didn't need to repent. But he did give us one verse, which is a very good illustration of metaneo. And it's simply this. Not my will, but thy will. That is repentance. Lord, I've lived according to my own desires. I've gone my own way. And now I'm saying to you, not my will, but thy will be done. I want your will in my life from this day forward. I want to go God's way and not my own. Metaneo. I'm turning around. I'm changing the way that I think. I don't think I know everything anymore. I believe God knows it all. And so, not my will, but God's will be done in my life. Turn to Matthew <clears throat> chapter 21. Here is a parable illustration of repentance. Matthew 21, verse 28. Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work in the vineyard. And he answered and said, certainly, I'll do it. But he didn't go. Here's the son saying, Lord, Lord. Yeah, Jesus is my Lord. But he didn't go. He did his own thing. He came to the second and said the same thing. But he answered, I'm not going. No, don't want to do it. Yet afterwards, what? He repented. There's the word. He repented. He wasn't going that way. He wasn't going to go and do the will of the Father. He wasn't going to. But he repented and did it. He went. And dear friends, that's it. We need by an act of will to say, I've been living in rebellion to God. I've been going my own way. I've been doing my own thing, but no more. I'm going to get up. And I, am, I want to do the will of the Father. I want to do God's will from this day forward in my life. I want to give you three helpful 
check pointers from God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about a state of a backslidden apostate church where men will be lovers of self instead of lovers of God. When men will be lovers of money rather than lovers of God. And when men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. When we repent, what are we saying? We're saying, I am no longer going to live for what I want, for my comforts, for my pleasure, for my way. I'm not going to be a lover of pleasure anymore. I'm going to be a lover of God. The only thing that's going to matter is to do the will of the Father and to finish it. What does repentance mean? It means that we say, I am no longer going to be a lover of and a server of money. Most of us don't want to admit it, but we live for and serve money. Possessions and money. Some more than others, but it's a simple fact. And Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. Every day you will get up and you will willfully live according to a certain principle. Am I going to do what I want today? Am I going to think about what I fancy? How I'm going to spend my time? Am I going to order my day because I need more money and more things? Or am I going to say, gone with it all. I only want to do the will of God and to glorify Jesus today. That is ultimately what it means to deny ourselves, isn't it? When we're living for pleasure, when we're living for money, we're, we're really living for ourselves. It's the end of self. That's what repentance ultimately is. And it's an act of the will. I just don't want that anymore. <clears throat> the last thing I want to say is there's a time, dear friends, to repent. Whether we realize it or not, there's a time. Turn to Revelation and chapter 2. Revelation and chapter 2. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. We all need to repent and to believe the gospel. We need to repent and call upon the Saviour. We need to meet with Jesus that he regenerates us by the Holy Spirit, that the only one who has authority on on earth to forgive sins would cleanse us and change our hearts so that we be born again in newness of life. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we repent. By an act of our will, we say, no more going my own way. No more doing my own thing. No more living for money. No more living for pleasure. I don't want any of that anymore. I want Jesus to be the focus of my life. I want Jesus to be in control of my time. I want Jesus to be in full control of everything I own. 
I forsake all my possessions, everything, my time, my body, everything belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 20. Oh, sorry, Revelation 2 and verse 20. Jesus says to this church in Thyatira, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. You put up with false religion. So many churches, dear friends, they put up with false religion. They join with other churches whose doctrines are blatantly obviously wrong. And they usually call it churches together or something like that. Jesus says, I've got this against you. You're tolerating false religion. We cannot tolerate false religion. We can't tolerate the worship of money. We can't tolerate prosperity preaching. We can't tolerate, dear friends, denial of foundational doctrines. Don't tolerate it. It's a spirit of false religion. It's Jezebel. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her what? Time to repent. Jesus says... This woman Jezebel, this section of the church, these people, it's not just one woman, you understand. It's a group of people who are preaching a false gospel, a false religion, which is idolatrous. And Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. But she doesn't want to repent. She doesn't want to repent. I gave her time. How much time? He doesn't say. But there's a time, dear friends. The Lord was speaking to these people. The Lord was opening their eyes. Showing them that their doctrine was wrong. Showing them that they departed, that they were outside of the truth. God was calling them to turn around. God was showing them they were going the wrong way. And saying, repent. And there was a time when they could have repented. But they wouldn't. And so Jesus said, I'm going to kill her children. You know the time for repentance passes? When should we repent, dear friends? When we hear the voice of the Lord saying, repent. We don't know how long we've got, but there's a time to repent. And there's a time when you will not find repentance. You'll not find it. I find that a frightening idea and a frightening thought, but it's biblical. Esau sought for repentance and couldn't find it. He treated God, he treated the things of God so shabbily and so flippantly. He'd sold his whole birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. He was living for his belly. For the gratification of his body, he gave up spiritual things. You say, well, nobody would ever do that. Really? And then when he really, he was grief-stricken. He'd lost the blessing. He could not find repentance. You know, 
It's going to be too late. Four times in the book of Revelation, in the last days when God is pouring forth of his judgments, it says, and they would not repent. They wouldn't. The time for repentance is almost over. And if we are convicted, if we are awakened, if we hear the Lord speaking to us and telling us that we need to repent, when should we repent? Now, dear friends, today, as long as it's called today, because tomorrow might be too late. Tomorrow might be too late. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Jesus came. The people that walked in darkness saw a great light, dear friends. John the Baptist, the messenger, the voice crying in the wilderness, announced him, Behold the Lamb of God. And Jesus came preaching repentance and preaching the gospel and calling people to follow him and doing extraordinary miracles. And he was proved to be the Son of God. Dear friends, people walking in great darkness suddenly saw a great light burst forth upon them. It was Jesus, the light of the world. Matthew 11, verse 20. He began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done. Why? Because they did not repent. They wouldn't repent. How did they know they were supposed to? Because that was his message, dear friends. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent. <coughs> and he said, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago. If they'd seen the light, if they'd heard the call to repent, they would have repented. But you, <coughs> you heard the command, you heard the call, you saw extraordinary things happen, you knew it was the voice of the living God, and you were not willing, you would not repent. Dear friends, repentance is not an emotion. It is an act of the will to change our way of thinking, to turn around, to stop going in that direction and completely turn around and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and look to him. To stop living for ourselves, to stop living for pleasure, to stop living for things and for money and gratification, and to start living for the glory of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said to these cities, Woe to you. You're now accursed. Were they still alive? Oh yeah. They were still all walking about. They were still going down to the synagogue. But an extraordinary light had come into their lives. They saw something real. They heard the voice of the living God. But they would not repent. And Jesus said, you're now accursed. Accursed. It's a terrifying thought, dear friends. But there is a time limit for those who are hearing the voice of God, who know that they should repent, who know that God is calling them to turn around, and who don't obey his voice. God forbid that there be anybody here 
or anybody listening to this message. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Repent. 37 years ago, <clears throat> I went to a Bible study in a church that wasn't preaching repentance. No one ever talked about repentance. Talked about accepting Jesus. They talked about receiving Jesus. They talked about all kinds of things. But nobody ever mentioned repentance. But by the grace of God, I knew I needed to repent. I was living for money. I was living for pleasure. I was living for myself. And I knew I was going in exactly the wrong direction. And nobody told me, but God told me I needed to turn around to completely repent. I'm so grateful that he did. When I saw the meaning of Calvary, that Jesus had borne my sins in his own body and paid the penalty with his death on the cross, that awful suffering, it made sense to me. I broke God's law. Jesus paid my penalty. Now, what else could he do? That was the thought in my mind. What else could God do for me? He'd shown me that he was real. He'd revealed the gospel. And I just knew. And by an act of my will, I said, that's it. I'm not going to live for money anymore. I'm not going to live for my pleasures anymore. I don't want to go my own way anymore. I know the way that is taking me. I'm on my way to hell and I need to get off that path. I need to turn around without ever hearing the word repent, dear friends. I repented. I repented. But sadly, of all the people who made a commitment in that church, I'm the only one I know of 37 years later, who is walking with the Lord and following Jesus. We need to stop preaching a gospel without repentance. It's doing no good. It's producing, at best, false converts people who are double minded unstable in all their ways James says one minute they're so one to be on fire for Jesus the next minute they're living for the world they're living for pleasure they're living for money why? because nobody ever really told them that they must repent you must Repent. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Turn around. Change the way that you look at your life. Change the way that you think. Change the direction. And turn to God. And call upon him that he'd meet with you. Because repentance leads to life. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Lord, if anything I've said this morning has not been clear, Lord, you're our teacher. You're the one who gives understanding. We pray the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Father, we want to ask that you'll help us, help us to be faithful to your word in preaching, a message of repentance.
from dead works of trust in the Lord Jesus. Lord, that people may come to genuine, genuine salvation and be born again. Lord, would you help us to see those areas of our lives where we need to change our way of thinking and turn and come to you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.